It's no secret that I love the Commodore 64. It is a fantastic machine, especially when it's actually working. But of course, with this old technology, it's only a matter of time before it stops. And let's be honest, I kind of like that too, because I like fixing these things. But it doesn't really help that replacement parts aren't always readily available. Uh, thankfully, we now have a lot of modern replacements for these aging components. And one thing I really did like the look of is the arm SID. It's just a very neat package that fits straight in the socket. And recently I came across the Slim PLA, which is based on the ultra reliable GAL PLA, but just slimmed down to a smaller dip size package. The other GAL is hiding on the bottom. So that got me thinking about other things in this machine that fail and need replacing, and one of those is the ROMs. As you can see in this machine, I've had to use a 28-pin EEPROM to replace the 24-pin kernel ROM because it died. Unfortunately, while these things are super handy, they're not the prettiest thing in the world to look at. You need a little interposer board to go from the 24-pin socket to the 28-pin EEPROM. Now, while there were 24-pin EEPROMs, they haven't been made in a very long time, and they're pretty hard to come by these days, and you also need a specialized programmer to actually program them. The TL8662, the T48 and the T56 or whatever they want to call them these days will not handle those EEPROMs. So I started thinking about other ways we could shrink something like this down to the footprint of something like this and also keep it neat at the same time and I think I managed to do just that. This is a kernel ROM replacement. As you can see, it matches the footprint of the other ROMs and it's nice and clean on the top. All I've done is put the little MOS logo and of course the part number and a build date, sort of akin to what you'd see on the original chips. And of course I couldn't stop there. Now what else uses 24 pin ROMs that often fail? Oh yeah. Hmm, the 1541 is kind of slow though could really use a bit of a speed up. Ah, Jiffy DOS, much better. Hmm, but now we need Jiffy DOS in the C64. There we go, four kernels are better than one. Oh, there's a bit of room left on that character ROM as well. Why not have switchable characters? Okay, maybe I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. Let's have a look at what these things actually are. So as I mentioned, the top is plain apart from the logo on the part number, which means all the magic must happen on the underside. And there we go. So what we have here is an Atmel AT28C64E EEPROM. So this just holds a copy of whatever ROM it's designed to replace and I added a bit more text on the underside. After that it was just a lot of careful routing to try and keep all the traces off the top side and give it the cleanest possible look. And all of these are a perfect drop-in replacement for the original ROMs, whether you've got a dead one that needs to be replaced or you've got one of these sort of fairly ugly EEPROMs in there, or perhaps you just want to lower the power consumption of the ROMs. Uh, on testing these, they use about 5 milliamps at 5 volts, and the original ROMs usually use around 70 milliamps. So these obviously use a lot less power and will run completely cold, unlike the original ROMs, which get quite toasty in some machines. So these will all be up in my Tindy store, and hopefully they'll actually be cheaper than buying the original Commodore ROMs off eBay or wherever. I'll also try and have some kits available just in case you want to replace all three ROMs in the 64 or both ROMs in the 1541 or the whole lot. Now of course I didn't stop there because looking at the character ROM it only takes up 4 kilobytes and the EEPROM has 8 kilobytes available so I thought well maybe we could have a switchable character ROM so that's what I did. This one has the same 28C64 EEPROM on the bottom, but with some slightly different routing and the inclusion of a little switch, you can switch on the fly between the original Commodore 64 font and the pet style font. Now the reason I went for a little switch on the underside is of course to keep everything as neat as possible on the top side, and I don't think people are going to be switching this thing that often, so I don't think it's really worth it to route it to an external switch on your Commodore 64 case, and of course you'd probably have to make a hole in the case to route that switch to, so I thought well let's just keep it simple and put the switch on the ROM itself, and from the top you can hardly notice it. And going back to the 1541, I thought it'd be great to have Jiffy DOS in there. So I created this little one, which obviously uses a slightly larger EEPROM because it holds the original Commodore ROM and Jiffy DOS. And that is selectable by this little pin header up here. So I've just used a jumper for this. And uh, you can either put it over here for the Commodore ROM or over this side for Jiffy DOS. You could also use some little DuPont connectors and route that to an external switch on the 1541 case, but once again, I'm not a huge fan of drilling holes in cases. So I tried to avoid that. And to be honest, I found Jiffy DOS to be incredibly compatible. In fact, I'm yet to find something that it fails on. 
So I'm pretty much just going to leave this set to Jiffy DOS all the time. And if I ever do come across something that doesn't work with it, then I can always swap it back over to the Commodore ROM. Just need to take the lid off the drive. So I'd be super curious to know if anyone can find a program that doesn't work with Jiffy DOS enabled on a 1541. I'd love to be able to test that out myself, but yeah, I haven't found one and it's not for a lack of trying. So the 1541 Jiffy DOS ROM will also be available on the store uh, and it will include a license for Jiffy DOS. So I've already pre-purchased the license so you don't have to worry about any licensing issues. And uh, the dual character ROM will also be on the store if you like the idea of having two character sets. And the last thing is the four kernel switcher, which isn't quite ready yet. I still need to do a bunch of documentation and get that up on GitHub uh, because it is based on code from other developers. Obviously they've shared the code, but I need to write that up and attribute it back to them. So uh, we're not gonna go into the four kernel switcher today. I really should be using something else other than my fingers to try and pull that out. Make sure I don't bend the pins. But um, yes, we will go into the four kernel switcher in a future video and also take a look at differences in kernel ROMs and what they can be used for and what some of the downsides are to using a replacement kernel ROM. So um, that was it for this one, just a really short video on these ROM replacements. So a massive thanks to the people that support the channel on Patreon. Thank you all for watching, liking, subscribing, all that stuff. And uh, yeah, links to all this stuff will be in the video description. But uh, I really feel like we need to do a repair of something in the next video. It's been too long. So uh, look out for that. But until then, thank you for watching. Bye. Eprom? Eprom. Eprom. Eva.